Good evening and welcome to Nigger Leaguers in Puerto Rico, Juan Tatelo Vargas, the Dominican Deer. Good evening, Good evening and welcome for joining us uh, This for now our seventh episode of Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico. My name is Adam Dorowski. I'm the product director at Sports Reference. We make baseball reference and stat head, but I'm joined as always tonight by my dear friend, Jorge Colon Delgado. How are you, Jorge? Uh, very happy. Another episode and this one, you know, you know that Tetelo Vargas was good, but he was great. And you have, pres you have, uh, we have a pre presentation here not all, only about Puerto Rico, but uh, United States and all Latin America. So let's start eager to learn about Tetelo Vargas. Yeah, and I'll be honest, Tetelo Vargas, I did not know him until we launched the Negro League stats at, at Baseball Reference. Yes. And all of a sudden, the new all-time single-season batting average leader was a player named Tetelo Vargas that I did not know anything about. So... Uh, as with so many of the players on the, that have made their way to the site there, I started reading about him and learning more about him, learning from you about him, learning from many others about him, and just found out not only was it Vargas, who was just this incredible player who played all over the, the Western Hemisphere, but there were many, many other players like him that we'll kind of touch on a little bit later. But tonight is all about Juan Tatelo Vargas, who I believe is, you know, I. I say this about a lot of these players that I've discovered. I mean, they're all great. They're all amazing players. But I truly believe that Tatilo Vargas is a unknown all-time great. Yep. One of the yep. best players in baseball history. Yes, I agree with you. And I know that all the people that are with, with us tonight are going to agree with us. Let's begin with this great presentation. <laughs> and if anybody doesn't, by the end, they will. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, so Tatela Vargas was born in 1906. Uh, this photo here, he is with uh, the, now where, which, which team was this that he, he's with? Caguas. Caguas, yes, okay, in, in Puerto Rico. And you can see here that he, he passed away in Puerto Rico, even though he was Dominican. And what's interesting about uh, Vargas is he was the first great Dominican player. He played a lot in Puerto Rico and he ended up marrying uh, a Puerto Rican woman, a woman, I actually believe. Uh, then he married a second uh, Puerto Rican woman, settled there and died there. He lived there the rest of his life. So he really, really loved uh, the island and uh, made it his own, uh, even though that's not where he was born. Yes. Uh, um, he was a... Uh very uh, beloved in Puerto Rico. And after he retired, we're going to see later, he stayed in Guayama, he married, all his siblings are from Guayama. And as you said, uh, he was very, he is very in Guayama and he has an avenue, one of the principal avenues of Guayama has his name. So oh. he was a very important uh, uh, figure in Guayama. That's awesome. Right. We're going to get into uh, his years there as well. But this next slide. So when I said his stats were added to baseball reference, this is what was added. We had five seasons of statistics from him with various number of, of uh, games played. But you can see that 1943 season, a 471 batting average. And because the, we did not have uh, an incredible number of, of uh, box scores from the 1943 New York Cubans. And, and he played in enough of them to qualify for the batting title. And that became our single season batting average record on baseball reference. And we've had some updates uh, from the Seamheads Negro Leagues database since then, but that record has remained untouched. And it's just a remarkable season there. And you see, it's not the only one that he, he hit really well. And there's another season there where he hit 349 in 44 games. 379 and 25 games, and then some shorter, uh, smaller samples where he didn't hit quite as well. But there are some uh, sources that say in all competition, like uh, including the barnstorm barnstorming games, he was, you know, again, well over 300. And he just basically hit three or 400 everywhere that he went. 
So the the bulk of the the presentation that I'm going to be telling you about is the <laughs> the seasons that are not captured in that baseball reference slide. He played 22 seasons in Puerto Rico, some of them in the professional league, some of them before the professional league was established. He played uh, 11 seasons in Venezuela. And in some of those seasons in Venezuela, he actually played in uh, tours of Puerto Rico as well. He played nine seasons in the United States. So you only saw five of them in that previous slide, but he did play for some barnstorming teams such as the Havana Red Sox and the Cuban House of David. Played seven seasons in his native Dominican Republic, including the very interesting 1937 season that we'll talk about some. Played three seasons in Cuba and even played uh, one season uh, as a youngster in Colombia. He is not in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, but he is a member of three Halls of Fame. He was uh, inducted into the second class of the Puerto Rican Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, the first class being in 91, he was inducted in 1992. So Cuba's Hall of Fame, I have an asterisk here <laughs> because it's a little tricky. Uh, for a time there, uh, there was a unofficial, uh, quote unquote, in exile uh, era where the, they continued to induct players, but now the, the actual Cuban Hall of Fame doesn't recognize all of those uh, selections. It's a little bit tricky to explain, but during that time in between, he was elected. And uh, I think it's likely that he might get elected again by the official uh, body. So we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on that. And then the Latino Baseball Hall of Fame inducted him in 2010, uh, because as you can see, he just played all over the place in Latino baseball. Now, now these numbers here that I have, the all-stars, the batting titles, and the gold gloves, these are like a minimum. Like we don't have stats for every season. He had the, the eight uh, all-stars, the three batting titles, and one gold glove, which interestingly enough, that gold glove came when he was 47 years old. So it can tell you what kind of a, a defender he really was. So the next slide here, this I have uh, not only for Tatella Vargas, but for many, many other players who were peers of his that played all over the place in, in Latin America. I've tried to collect as many of his stats from other published sources as I can find. Now, I did not go through box score after box score to compile these stats. These are from uh, books on Cuban baseball. These are from my friend Jorge here, who has uh, the, the stats from Puerto Rico on the Negro Leaguers in Puerto Rico.com. And um, Dr. Leighton Ravel from the Center for Negro League Baseball Research has many seasons such as the, the Dominican League as well. And what I've done is from those sources, I've put together this slide, which is kind of intentionally difficult to read because it just shows the enormity of the, the length of his career, 33 seasons across six countries. Now on the next slide, I, I give you the nice totals. So those, all of those rows add up to 5,219 at-bats, which now we're getting to be a, a really good sample here. And 1,686 hits for a 323 batting average. Now, one thing that's important to remember, you remember a lot of the early seasons were empty, meaning that when he was a young player, we don't have any stats for those seasons. So those are seasons when he was kind of in his prime. What we do have for Vargas is a lot of seasons in his later career. And in some of those, he started to slow down, understandably. So uh, when we get into his uh, stats by country, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But the second row here is the, the rate stats. So on a 600 at bat rate, he hit 323, 129 runs scored, 194 hits. The runs batted in, it's important to, to mention a couple things. First of all, he was typically a speedster leadoff man. So you can see that in the runs scored total. But a lot of the seasons I collected, I don't have RBI total. So that's why that one is a little bit low. Same with stolen bases. We're missing a lot of stolen bases. He was known to be uh, an incredible base runner and uh, from the seasons that I have, 25 stolen bases per 600 at bats. Still, the 428 slugging to go, go along with that batting average means he had some pop as well, as you can see with those triples and doubles. Mm -hmm. So the next slide, this in, uh, introduces MLEs. Now I'm gonna take a second to explain what an MLE. MLE stands for Major League Equivalency. Uh, a friend and fellow researcher, Eric Shalek, has developed a system that attempts to uh, estimate the statistics that a player from the Negro Leagues would uh, produce if 
that one player was lifted from his career and put into the ALNL. So it's important to say that what Eric isn't doing, he's not doing this as if the entire league was integrated and every black and Afro Latino player was in the AL and NL. He's saying just you're taking one player and putting them in just because that's otherwise it would be way too much speculation. But with this, he has a pretty good system where you can estimate. And these are the stats that he comes up with for Totelo Vargas. He has 9,583 at bats, which is a long career, of course, because we saw he played 33 years. Obviously in, in major league equivalencies, he wouldn't have played that long, but still it's a over 20 year career. And then 3000 hits. He believes that he would have been a 3,000 hit man. Well, I, I say Eric believes that. Eric's system believes that. If you ask Eric himself, he will say that uh, Totelo Vargas is one of the players he, that has the largest error bars, he would say. So the, the, the system is making the most uh, guesses or estimations about him because a lot of the stats that I have are for seasons that uh, Eric doesn't have complete data for. So it's harder to make... Uh, uh, an assessment based on those seasons. So there's a little bit more speculation in these numbers, but as you can see in the MLE rates per 600 at bats, it's pretty similar to what I was finding uh, in the seasons that he played all over the world. So I think Eric's actually done a pretty good job here of estimating what a, a full career of Tatello Vargas would look like. And if you look at it by wins above replacement, he would be basically a 70 war player, which essentially means that we're looking at a hall of famer here. I I just love these numbers. It's amazing to see uh, not only the numbers that he compiled when you actually find the real numbers, but then when you use these estimations and, and systems like that, you can actually find uh, you know, just the type of player he would have translated into. So this is zooming in on that big chart. These are just the seasons that he played for teams in Puerto Rico. So this isn't like tours of Puerto Rico with other teams, but this is... Uh, when he played in a league in Puerto Rico. And you can see the gap here between 1928 and 1938. So as a youngster, he played in Puerto Rico before it was a professional league. So this was an amateur system. And I don't know, uh, Jorge, if you could kind of tell the, the, the watchers and listeners about uh, what baseball was like in Puerto Rico before the beginning of the uh, professional league. Well, it was uh, it was organized, but it was mostly amateur, and uh, they made uh, all star teams to go to Venezuela, and Dominican Republic, and uh, and to participate in the Central American Games. But all that began to change in 1931 when La Ligas Extranjeras, foreign foreign league. They became all those Negro leaguers to come to Puerto Rico, Concordia, Las Estrellas de Ramirez, uh, New York Black Yankees, Brooklyn Eagles. They came every year uh, in the winter. And that was before they played from 1931 to 1937. And then in 1938 uh, began the professional baseball league, Puerto Rico professional baseball league. As a matter of fact, last May, 20, May 22nd, it was our our 85th anniversary. Oh wow! Yeah, so we are this this year we're celebrating 85 years of professional baseball in Puerto Rico. That's amazing. Yeah, and that first year, of course, had many of the Latin American and and Negro League stars. Like obviously, uh, Pancho and Perucho played in the league because they were native to the island. But Tatelo was there as well, um, and right away the league was just a uh, very very impressive so he was with guayama uh right away in 1938 and he hit 415 in the in the very first season of the the league and you can see the the batting averages from right from when he started off 415 363 331 346 410 just an amazing hitter and the stolen base totals also quite a few of them as well some of those seasons are missing stolen bases some of the totals are low which makes me think that maybe there there's only some stats for for some of the the games but uh you'll also notice in this slide how old to was when he was playing in this league 
um, ignore my typo in, in 1944, 45, but you can see that when the league began, much like Pancho Coimbre and, and Perucho Cepeda, he was older. So he was 32 years old when the league began. And by the time he ended playing in the league, he, he was 48 years old. And you can see at the, the tail end there, some of those seasons, he did struggle more. So if you go to the next slide and you just focus on age 32 to 41, this gives you a good glimpse of what he was like, not even in his prime, but like in his late prime. A 368 hitter with a 510 slugging. Like these are just incredible numbers from a a speedster who also had, you know, just this incredible contact ability. He was stealing tons of bases, hitting a lot of triples, hitting only a lot of doubles and a few home runs here and there too. So he was a well-rounded player. And not only that, you know, he, by now he was an outfielder, but he was a exceptional outfielder. And in his younger days, he was a, a shortstop as well. Tatello played a lot of years too in Venezuela. This is kind of, uh, a lot of these are earlier in his career as well. You can see uh, Concordia, like we mentioned earlier, that's the team he was playing for when uh, he traveled to Puerto Rico as a, not for the first time, because he was playing in Puerto Rico in the amateur leagues when he was a teenager, but uh, with, he traveled uh, with this Concordia team. We're going to show you some photos later of the, this team. There were some absolute stars on this team, such as Josh Gibson, uh, just to name one. Yeah. Uh, and, but uh, across all these seasons, fewer games available in a lot of these seasons, but in the ones that we have, it's a 315 average and 439, pretty consistent with what we we see of Totello in, in other places. Just always a 300 hitter, always uh, doing everything. One thing that stands out here is the number of stolen bases that he had. You know, this is 378 at bats, so like a portion of a season, but he's got 44 steals, and a lot of those seasons we don't have stolen bases for. Vargas in the United States was also something to behold. We know that in 1943, he set that batting average record, but that was not the only time that he hit well in the United States. In fact, if you look at it, like this was the, the country he found it the easiest to hit in out of all of the places that he played. 359 batting average in 190 games. So well over a full quote unquote ALNL season worth of games with the 519 slugging. Again, a good number of stolen bases, but here we see more power. Uh, 43 doubles, 15 triples, 15 home runs. But that 359 really stands out. It makes you think, ooh, <laughs> the, the Negro Leagues were great, but uh, the other the other leagues that he played in start to look really good when you see that uh, he excelled even more in the Negro Leagues than maybe he did in the other ones. Also his native Dominican Republic. <laughs> some of these seasons are when he was very young. Some of these are when he was very old. In that 1953 season where he hit 355, he won the batting title and won the gold glove. Just unbelievable production as a much older player. Uh, again, so a lot of these stats are when he's in his 30s and 40s, but still he's hitting 325 and slugging over 400. And it's still another sample of more than 800 at bats. So, you know, we're looking at multiple seasons at once, but when we add up these small numbers of games that we have, we end up with, you know, eventually getting to over 5,000 at bats, which that's a pretty good sample to, to learn about what type of a player we're looking at. And, you know, everywhere he went, it was similar numbers as well. Next, we have Cuba, which uh, he didn't play as much in just three seasons and uh, a smaller sample here of 416 at bats, but uh, he, didn't hit 300 here, which actually is a, something of note because usually he did. Um, a lot of the at-bats here in his age 36 season when he was a little bit older with Havana and hit 257 in uh, 191 at-bats. But overall, 286, uh, not as much uh, on the slugging side, but I have the feeling that some of these zeros might be because we don't have data available. Uh, or it could just be, you know, in, in some seasons, Cuba was a notoriously difficult place to hit. So if you looked at this in terms of OPS plus, it might look a little different. And then at age 19, he had the one season in Colombia, which stands out because not too many players I've looked at played in Colombia. I think uh, Quincy Troop is one other one who did. 
but uh, we don't have any stats for this season, but still very, uh, it's worth noting that he was heading down to play for Atlas uh, Baseball Club in 1925. So if you look at the totals across all of these countries, here they are. And you can see, you know, except for Cuba, where he dropped a few points below, he's hitting 300 everywhere. He's usually hitting well over 300 everywhere. He's slugging. He's got stolen bases. And boy, does he score a lot of runs. If we jump to the next slide, this, this is all normalized across like a 600 at bat sample in the next slide. The next slide, what is second? That next slide, nine, uh, number 16, is, is missing. Sorry. Oh, nope, no problem. So basically what I did on that slide is I, I took everything and normalized it to 600 at-bats. And all of a sudden, like, these stats all, again, look similar. for each In each country, he's got um, usually between uh, 125 and 140 runs per season. Uh, Cuba was a little bit lower. Um, 190s for hits in the mid thirties for doubles in, in the, the low teens for triples and uh, stolen bases were all over the place because uh, the different countries uh, recorded them differently. But in Venezuela uh, in particular, he was stealing 70 bases per 600 at bats. Very impressive. The batting averages of course stay the same, but again, those, those numbers all put together, give you a, a pretty good idea of the type of player to Vargas was. And I think, again, it's important to note that, the majority of these numbers came well after he was in his mid thirties and, you know, some things like, like RBI and stolen bases are incomplete. So in summary, just simply one of the best players from the Caribbean 43, 44, he was the first Dominican to win a batting title in Puerto Rico when he hit 410 and he's one of four players that batted 400 or better twice. Uh, he was first in triples in 38, 39. So that was the inaugural season. And then again in 46, 48, seven, which means he's probably like 40 something years old at this point when he's leading the league in triples, he was the leader in runs in that inaugural season. And then again, the following season, and then two more times after that first in stolen bases in 39, 40 and 40, 41. He led in slugging in that first season, 38, 39, uh, with six seventy seven. And lifetime in the league, he's fourth in runs scored, fifth in triples, sixth in batting average, and seventh in stolen bases. He, like we mentioned before, he's named to the, the Puerto Rico Professional Baseball Hall of Fame in 92. In 2014, he was selected as one of the best 75 players in the history of the Puerto Rican Professional League. And now we have uh, essentially a scrapbook of incredible photos because I don't know about you, Jorge, but I was just shocked, like the number of photos that are available for Totelo from like throughout his life. This is him on the right as the mascot for the Lycee uh, Tigres in 1921. So he's very young at this point. I think he was playing for Lycee's second team at this point. And uh, uh, I was reading one article, I think it was on Baseball 101, where he was signed away uh, from Lycee and it was treated in the press almost like like Babe Ruth being sold by the Red Sox. It was like they had their their young mega star and they just let him slip away. He signed on with uh, uh, his his brothers with, uh, let's see, it was uh, Escogido, that's what it was, the Leones. Leones. And that's where he, he started his career there uh, with the Leones rather than the Tigres. And here he is again. He looks a little bit taller because he's not next to those giant men, but uh, he's, <laughs> he's the, the mascot there uh, with Lacey again. Yep. And here's the, the Lacey team. Is that, that's not him in the middle there. That's, no, that's him on the right. The, he's in the right, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, I they must have had a couple of mascots. I, I don't actually know who was on this 1921 team. That would be interesting to find out. That's kind of the, the missing piece in a lot of this research that I've been doing is, all right, now, who who are the teammates uh, yep. on all these teams? Because a lot of times we'll find these really good uh, groups of players together, which we're about to see in some of the other teams they played for. So 1922, he's still the mascot there, seated in the front. Mm -hmm. It's a great photo. And then Humacao, this is uh, this is in Puerto Rico at 17 years old, 
uh, playing in the amateur league. So I, I wonder just how amateur it was because I don't know how, how um, common it was for a player to, of 17 years of age, to go from his native Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico to play baseball. I wonder if, if he was scouted and somehow compensated for his skills, uh, even if it was not a fully professional league yet. Playing in Venezuela with Concordia. Uh, we're going to have quite a few shots with Concordia Eagles here. Aguilas. So this one, you're going to have to help me out here with this. Yeah, that's uh, one. He represented Puerto Rico, and he was playing in the Dominican Republic. Mm, OK. But ah, I was in, so <laughs> in playing in his native Dominican Republic, but representing Puerto Rico. That's interesting. Yep. Here he is again with Concordia in 1931. Still a very young Tatelo. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna see him getting much older. So here we go. We've got uh, Tatelo is the one on the right. I, that's what I thought because in the middle is this Dehigo? Yes, the Eagle, and in the left Marcelino Blondet from Puerto Rico, great player mm -hmm. uh, who managed Concordia, and he. Uh, his name, he was nicknamed El Brujo, the witch. Mm. Marcelino El Brujo Blondet, Martin Diego, and Tetelo Vargas with the Concordia. Yes, this Concordia team, you know, they had players such as Dehigo and Josh Gibson, who we're going to see a little bit later. Unbelievable. Uh, then here he is with Concordia's John Eyes, who you might recognize from the, the National League. So, uh, you know, they were attracting a lot of wonderful players over there in, in, uh, in Venezuela. Of course, here there, again, this looks like one of those traveling uh, exhibitions where uh, he, Mize was playing for Concordia, which is based in Venezuela, but playing in a tournament in the Dominican Republic in 1954. You see that, that the, the, the ballpark has a double deck. Yeah, that is a beautiful park. Yeah. Very rare. That's the Concordia Eagles. Uh, here, here's some look at the players. We've got Vargas, we've got Tejigo, we've got Blonde, we've got Gibbon, we've got Rap Dixon in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, is that Pedro Sam on the right? It's tough. Yeah, Pedro Sam. Pedro Sam, yep. And then on the, the left, second, is Luis Aparito Sr. Yes. So just a, a, a lot of really names. Aparicio was also a short correct? Yep. Yeah, he was. So, like, I I just looking at these teams because there's so many stars here. Just, you know, just to have Rap Dixon in the middle. You've Gibson and Joe, of course. Like, if, if you're counting on two of the greatest players in the history of the game, that's two of your fingers right there. Vargas, we've talked about, is also incredibly underrated. You have the, the father of a Hall of Famer here in Luis Aparicio, and then other players who are lesser known, such as Blade and, and uh, Pedro Sam. Mm -hmm. Just an incredible team. And here's the, the following season where we again have Vargas, uh, Dehigo, uh, and Aparicio. But on the right here, you can see Emilio Navarro and also Alejandro Ohms, who we've, we've talked about a couple times. And then on the left here, uh, we have the this uh, stocky pitcher here, Manuel Cocaina Garcia, who is mm -hmm. just, he's an incredible story as well. Just uh, uh, another player who played all over the place and uh, probably won well over 300 games if, you, if somebody was able to tally up his, his stats from all over the place. Gavilanes. Uh, so this team was based in, is this Venezuela as well? Yes, Venezuela, Maracaibo. Yeah, okay. Right. So he, here he played in, you have September 37 here. Yeah, I have him there in 36. So he very well might have played there in 37 because I don't have anything in Venezuela for 37. But in 36, he, he hit 295 in the 14 games that I have. But you can see here, uh, Tatelo is the fourth one in on the top left. You have uh, Luis Aparicio again, and then you have another famous father. You have Luis Tian, and then uh, I'm not sure who this is, the third player. Lantigua. 
Lantigua. Gotcha. Okay. The cat. Okay. Yeah. So again, just uh, another great team here. Here he is in Guayama. This is the, the first season of the professional league in Puerto Rico. Guayama was the champion that year in the second and the 1938, 39, and 1939, 40. And he and they was won the, they won the World Series mm. of the his his teammate. Oh, I was just gonna say his teammate was uh Perucho Cepeda, correct? And yep. uh Perucho is right there in the middle on the bottom. And who else did he have on his team here? Well, they, they, they had, I think that those, those were the biggest name there. They, they, they have uh, Rafael Ortiz, who was a good pitcher. Bill and Perkins Conde. was the catcher. Right, right. Bill Perkins. Conde, right? Uh, wasn't he? I said, Sefo, Sefo Conde and Radamel Lopez. Was mm. Another, Menchin Pesante was there too. Moncho Blondet, the one that played with him in, in Concordia, was there too. Serrano. Uh, that was a great team, and that was the second edition of Guayama. Satchel Page won 19 games. And oh, right. <laughs> Satchel Page, we didn't even mention him. He's right there. And, and Perucho was shortstop, batted fourth, and was champion again, batting champion two years in a row. The great Perucho Cepeda. We want to make a program about him, and about Perucho. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Ah, here he is with Joe Lewis in 1941. This I think that, that was right around the United States. The yeah, I was going to say that was around when he was pre playing pretty often in the United States. Yeah, it says, it says there, Cuban. New York City. Oh, yeah. August 1st, 1941. Yes, New York City. Yep, that was the year 349 for the Cubans in 44 games. With Habana in 1941 here. This is one of his uh, seasons in, in Cuba. All right. This is the 42-43 uh, Leones. He was again with Dehigo, again with uh, Cocaina Garcia. Did uh, did Garcia ever play for a, a Puerto Rican team? Yeah. I don't... I oh, he did? It. Yeah. Oh, wow. Very cool. I'll have to track that one down. I was thinking that he's he's probably the next pitcher I'll have to start collecting stats for. Oh, look at this. Here we go. Pancho Coimbre along with Tatelo and Amiel Brooks. I don't really know Amiel Brooks very well. No, he was he was a good good, good player. He came to in Puerto, he played in Puerto Rico in the first season in 1938 with Mayagüez. One of the three reinforcement players with Mayagüez. But so so. I played 14 years in the Negro Major Leagues. Holy cow. I gotta learn that name. Oh, he's a catcher. And I'm in, I'm in Brooks. Yeah. Excellent. Here he is uh with Mayaguez, uh 1944, 45. We can see he's finally getting uh, showing a little bit more age. Uh, yeah. He was kind of an ageless wonder for a while there, but now you know we're getting to be like 20 years into his career here. Oh, this one is a, a great one. 1944-45 uh, All-Star Game. Uh, so that is Tubby Scales in the top left, who mm -hmm. is the manager, I believe, of this team. Yep. And uh, let's see. We've got uh, Roy Campanella, <laughs> Partlow, Campanella, uh, Jethro. Yep. Davenport, Sammy Bankhead. Ah, Sammy Bankhead, too. Holy moly. Yeah, he Tommy played for Boss. some great teams. Oh, Tommy. Tommy, yeah. Yeah, Tommy Boss. And you have there Ray Parlo in the middle, in the uh, standing, mm -hmm. the fourth one. So this team had to have an outfield of, <laughs> of Tatello Vargas, Sam Jethro. Gosh, I don't even know who the third one would be, but I don't know how any balls would fall in. Was Lazaro Medina an outfielder maybe? That might First have been baseman. Him. Oh, we got Terrace McDuff McDuffie, too. Holy cow. Yeah, that was a good... Ah, the, the other outfielder was Alfonso Geral. Okay. He was a... He, Alfonso Geral was a player, you know, that all, always was in the shadow of those great players from Santurce, but he, in almost every season, he batted th over 300. But, you know, 
Willard Brown, Bob Thurman, all those guys, he was always overshadowed. But I'm mm -hmm. also Gerard from Virgin Island. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got him pulled up here. That That's great. Ah, here he is with a car from the Caguas fans. The Caguas fan, you know, the fans uh, made a, uh, collected the money. And uh, that was, in the United States, they gave cars to the, the ball players. In Puerto Rico, I only have identified three. The first one was Joe Busas with Mayagüez, who was manager. The second one was Tetelo Vargas. And the third one was Tony Perez. We call him here in Puerto Rico, Tony Perez. In the United States, Tony Perez, when he was with Santulce. So those are the three figures in Puerto Rico, the few players that that uh, they got a car as, as, as a gift from the fans. You know, that is a stat that I didn't get anywhere. That is amazing. <laughs> What, ah, the, the, the three cars? Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, I saw the other day, I saw a picture. They gave one to Jackie Robinson. Oh, wow. This was one that I had not seen before uh, when I was looking at this. And this this is one of the, the most beautifully clear photos I've seen of Perucha Cepeda. Yeah. And it's, I love this photo. And to Taylor, of course, just looking at him like, <laughs> that's our guy right there. And then <laughs> all of the Tetelo, Perucho, and and the first one, Radamel Lopez, the three of them came from Guayama. Mm -hmm. Those those were the years of the World War, Second World War. And they uh they distribute every year they made a they gave the players, you know. Uh, Tetelo Vargas played with Mayagüez and Santulce. Uh, Perucho Cepeda played with Santulce, Mayagüez, and San Juan and Caguas. Same with Radames Lopez. But after the war, Second World War finish, they, uh, the three of them, Radames Lopez, Tetelo Vargas, and Perucho Cepeda, uh, play with uh, Caguas. Mm -hmm. We're going to see them here. They, there there is there they are oh my gosh look at that photo so this is the the same four players that we just were looking yes, at yes the same four players they play with kawas they 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 be kawas because guayama didn't return to the league disappear uh no right now i'm looking up to tell it looks pretty tall in that photo what do we have we only have him as five nine wow okay he, he, he looks taller than Cepeda. Sure does. And Cepeda was 5'10", so. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that 5'9", uh, then. Yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. He's taller mm -hmm. than. So he he must be about six feet. Six feet. Right. Easily. Yeah, he, he this one, he just looks like a the tall slender type here as well uh this is with estrellas orientales which was a this was um a dominican team correct dominican republic yeah. yes okay where he played with them for for many many years including here when as he was uh, getting older i i have to assume that this one is much later in his career he was this is the team that he was playing for when he won that gold glove at 47. yes and you can see here like uh, you know who he reminds me of here <laughs> is Ooh. Julio Franco. Ah, oh, Julio Franco. Who just played forever and looked like a uh, an athletic specimen at this age as well in his late forties. And yeah, it it just he reminds me of of Franco uh, as well. It's another one. Yes. Was 52 53 so he's he's about 46 47 years old in this one this is this one you know 53 54 they won the championship that was the team that had hank Aaron. you can see uh, him in the middle yeah right there in the middle yeah right if if people can't see it look at the the five in the 54 and go straight down and there he is look at that and uh just below him to the left that's Jatelo, correct yep Jatelo and the and the manager mickey owens the brooklyn dodgers ah yeah and the other one is Foconde. And as we have talked here, 
Hank Aaron came as a second baseman and he had trouble defensively and they move him in Puerto Rico. Mickey Owens move him to right field and we know the history. Do we know who this is front row, second one from the left? Uh, that's Vic, Victor Pello, Vic Power. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, he looks very familiar. Yeah, <laughs> and a, a young Vic Power. Perfect. And the one with the sunglasses is uh, Roberto Vargas. Oh, okay. He played in the near release. And in the first row, the third row, the first one is Felix Mantilla. Oh, nice. He played with the Mets in Boston. Mm -hmm. And you had here in the two players at the left of Hank Aaron, that's Jim Rivera. Play with the White Sox. Mm. This is great. Oh, this radio program. This was in Puerto Rico, I assume? Yes, that, that was in Puerto Rico, I see. Radio program. And he, he kept in sports and he, he played, he worked in Guayama, in the sports department, you know. Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely questioning uh, the height here. He, he looks pretty tall here. Although we go to the next slide and he doesn't look so tall anymore. So we'll have to... <laughs> so here he yeah. is as a, as a pirate scout, which uh, is something that I only recently learned that he spent time as a, a scout for the pirates. And the, the player he's credited with signing is Julian Javier. I didn't know he was a pirate scout until this presentation. You sent me that. <laughs> yeah. You know, let, let, let's find out, uh, although he's, you know, you, you get older, you get smaller, but right. Julian Javier. I have him a 6'1 here, so. Oh, six one. Yeah, he has he has to be six feet uh, in, his, in his prime. Yeah. Or, you know, 5'11", six feet, I think so, yeah. Yeah, he's not 5'9". And as I, you say, I, a center fielder with all those big numbers. Right. Uh, I've gone through a similar thing with, with Heavy Johnson. He's listed as 5'9", uh, 200, and some, or 5'6", 200 in some place, or 5'7", I think it was. And some places have him as 6 feet, 250. It's it's all over the place. So it's And then you look at photos, and you see him standing next to a guy that you know is 6'1", and you're like, actually, he's probably 6 feet, 6'1". Yes. So we can 5'11", 6', six feet. You can go sure for that. <laughs> a great presentation, Adam. A great, uh, you, you did a, a lot of investigation, research, that's the correct word, research. So congrats. Very good. We learned a lot. I, I know that all the, the persons that are with us tonight learn a lot of, of the Telo Vargas. And as I say, I know, I knew that he was great, but not so great. And this this type of webinars teaches a lot about all these ball players, and 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 this is the first one that we we take not only Puerto Rico but the whole picture, mm -hmm. because we we I knew and you knew that he was good in Puerto Rico, but when you add as United States, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Cuba, you said, wow, this, this guy was good in every country. Right. And what's interesting, too, is the players that he played with in Venezuela, in the Dominican Republic, a lot of times they traveled together. So mm -hmm. it's it, you can't tell the story without including the other stories as well. These these countries were all places that were hotbeds of baseball where these players who were not given the, the proper opportunities in the United States, they found these these places where they could prosper. And we can see that these players had long productive careers that have to be seen in, in this at the same level as as uh, a lot of the careers that you see from you know any any random player from the al and nl yeah yeah I, I know that i have said this before but every time you see these numbers these players you know in conversation with people like you uh you man you you i have to think about what would happen if they had the chance to play in the big leagues mm -hmm. You know, it's so sad, and uh, and I know I'm sure that the numbers that we know about the white players, Beirut, Ty Cobb, uh, Lou Gehrig, Roger Hornsby, all those guys, they wouldn't have those numbers, definitely. No, nope. I'm nope. sure. Now, anytime somebody wants to tell me, well, you know, 
Totello Vargas wasn't playing against the top competition. Well, guess what? <laughs> Neither were the white players because they weren't playing against Totello Vargas. Yes. All right. All right. And um, that's the that's the beauty of this, and and uh, the beauty of uh, keep researching of all these players and keep talking about them. You know, so uh, frankly, uh, it's a great job. Congratulations for your great presentation. And we have another presentation in June of our friend Adam Laurovsky, and we want them him to talk about it. Yeah, I. I was uh, approached. Uh, I was. It was incredible to be approached by Sean Gibson uh, of the the Josh Gibson Foundation. He's Josh's great grandson, and he asked me if I would be interested in doing a talk for their uh, Negro Leagues Matter webinar series. And I wasn't really sure what to talk about, but players like the ones we've been talking about in these webinars really uh, resonated with me. So what I ended up doing was creating a a all-star team of this type of player and and uh, Totello Vargas is the center fielder of this team so in a way uh this part of the this presentation was a a preview of what what you'll get some of in, in the other uh presentation as well but uh the team is a lot of players that we recognize from our discussions here the the pitcher is Ramon Bragania who actually didn't play for any port uh Teams based in Puerto Rico, but he did play in Puerto Rico. Quincy Troop is the catcher, and he played uh, quite a few years in Puerto Rico. At first base, I have Perucho Cepeda because I have a lot of shortstops on this team. Second base, Marvin Williams, who played in, in Puerto Rico as well. Mm -hmm. Third base, Buster Clarkson, who is a Hall of Famer in Puerto Rico. The shortstop is Silvio Garcia, who only played, I believe, one year in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico but he did it as a pitcher and won the ERA title, just a, mm -hmm. an unbelievable player. And then in the outfield, we have three Hall of Famers from Puerto Rico. Uh, we have Pancho Coimbre in left. We have Totelo Vargas in center. And I originally had Wild Bill Wright as my right fielder, but I felt like he didn't play in enough countries. So I switched, swapped him out, and my right fielder is now Bob Thurman. Wow, Bob so, Thurman. And, and, I, and, you, and you included uh, Perucho Cepeda. That's the only one that did not play in the United States. Correct. He did not play in the United States at all. Um, but I still felt that his story was one yeah. that needed to be told. And I also picked a manager slash utility player for this team who I don't know if he ever played in Puerto Rico, but he, he was a pitcher, a first baseman, outfielder, and a managing legend, Lazaro Salazar. He's another guy very similar to... To, to Vargas, who I've just fallen in love with. He had a, a long career, did many, many different things, won 14 titles as a manager. Do you know if he ever played in Puerto Rico? I think I'm thinking about, I think he came with Almendares one year. That makes sense, yep. I think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to investigate and gonna write to you, but I, I'm almost sure that he played with Almendares, one, one of those winters. So uh -huh. as you can see, a lot of those players uh, played in Puerto Rico. Oh, gosh, what are four or five? Of, I think it's five of them are, are Hall of Famers in Puerto Rico. So yes. uh, it's it's a, quite the team of, uh, you know, honestly, I don't know if I should make the case that these players should be Hall of Famers, but I think I can at least make the case that these were Hall of Fame level talents. Yeah. Now, I don't know if... They would be eligible because they didn't really play that long in the United States. I don't really care about whether they're eligible or not. I want to share their story. So I'm very excited to do it. Yes. So June 3rd, 2023, Beyond the Negro Leagues Outsider Baseball Outside the United States by Adam Dawrowski. Please join us that day. It's going to be a great presentation. And let me see if I can uh, put here the comments. Okay. It found out a lot of people. Oh my goodness, I didn't have the comments open. Wow, this bunch. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Lise, I, I was pronouncing it wrong. Lise T. Yes. Thank you for uh, correcting me there. Lise, I sound like an American right there. Whew. Lise. Uh, excellent photos. Yeah, Victor, uh, Victor Peyer. Uh, 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 here's a, a explicano. Tell us who is Adam Dawrowski. 
Go ahead, Adam. Who am I? Oh gosh, uh, I'm a good friend of Jorge. Uh, I am. Uh, yeah, I, I'm the product director for Baseball Reference, and 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 uh, we work on, you know, Baseball Reference Stat Head. I just love being able to to help people use Baseball Reference better, and I love using it when I'm not working on it. It's just a. Uh, I I I feel like I've kind of figured out the the work life balance where from nine to five, I, I work on baseball reference and from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. I play with baseball reference. And baseball reference is number one. Every researcher, every baseball fan, that's the place to go. Great tool to learn about baseball. And now they have uh, Negro Leaguers in baseball reference. So you can go there and learn a lot. And uh, that's what Alan does. He works with baseball reference. Here's another greetings, Mr. Jorge Condegal. I've listened to everyone here. Thank you. Uh, it seems blessings to my friends. I just saw uh, some wonderful paintings that you shared from Ed. My gosh, those yeah. were beautiful. Ed Panas, uh, yes. No, it's a, a, a great painting. Brown. There were two or three of them. Willie three, Brown was one, right? Willie Brown, uh, Josh Gibson, and Jose Gacho Torres. Oh wow, they they were amazing. Ed, that is unbelievable work. Um, I'm in awe. Yeah, he he's a great painter, my friend, and he helps me a lot. So, let me see. Excellent, my friend Tom Forrest. Thank you, thank you so, for so many comments. Thank you for being with us. I really appreciate. I think this is the program with more comments. So we, we appreciate all those comments and you be, being with us. And uh, before we went on, we were talking about how the next show we think will be about Buster Clarkson, which I'm very excited about. Buster Clarkson. And we're going to do a type of program like today in Puerto Rico. And he's all over the place, right? He is uh, not quite as many places, but still quite a few. I can't wait to see the photos that you have as well, because uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of these photos came from Jorge, and you just you have so many photos. It's unbelievable. I, I look forward to those every time, because it just it takes these stats that I've been compiling, and it turns them into a real human. And I can see, like in the case of Tatela Vargas, we could see him from when he was a, a, a boy, uh, with, with, uh, as when he was the mascot all the way through to his late forties when he was playing and then beyond that too, as well. Just unbelievable. Uh, a special hello. To, uh, let me say hello to, uh, Jaime Denizar. He liked the program. He saw that he, uh, his father talked to him about Tetelo Vargas. Thank you, Jaime, for being with us. Uh, Ed Pana, Roberto Husino, thank you. I don't know who is, but he also, he's always with us. Uh, Facebook user, not name, but thank you, Facebook user with with, with us. And, uh, my friend Raul Ramos is there too. Nice. So next next uh, month we're gonna have Buster Clarkson. We, we're gonna have a, another great program. Thank thank you so much. Uh, Adam and wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I hope to see some of you on on June third, and uh, the ones that I don't, I'll see next month when we talk Buster Clarkson. Great. So until next, let me see here next until next month. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. <laughs>